Before I get into my, my message, I brought some backup. I got a, a calendar of dad jokes that we're going to go through, and we're going to make sure that you have a sense of humor. Because if you don't laugh, I've got about 360 more days that I could pull from. So we'll be here a while. Let's see, this is when I thought, I actually did giggle on this one when I read it in my office. Becca got me this calendar last year, and so I saved it for today. And this one right here got me tickled. <laughs> I'm reading a horror story in Braille. Something bad is going to happen. I feel it. Do you get it? All right, I'm going to say it again. I'm just kidding. Did you hear about the kidnapping at the elementary school? He woke up. I think I need Larry on the drums. <laughs> Jose, feel free to steal some of these for tonight. I will leave them on your desk. You can translate. Why can't a... I told this one to Becca, and Becca... She kind of giggled, too. Why can't a nose be an inch long? Because then it would be a foot. <laughs> Twelve inches is a foot. You... Oh, my. This is going to be a tough crowd. I... <laughs> and I'm not going to do that one. Not that one. My wife told me to stop impersonating a flamingo. So I had to put my foot down. <laughs> Abby, did you get that one? <laughs> I'm not going to do that one. I meant to make a slide for that one. That one's pretty funny, but you wouldn't get it. I trapped a couple of vegan burglars in my basement. At least I think they were vegan. They kept shouting, let us leave. Let us leave. Oh, man, you're a hard crowd today. I'll do one more. Um, I just found out my new electric toothbrush is not waterproof. I was shocked. <laughs> Did you get that one? Yeah. You're, you're free the, uh, to come take as many as you want. They are, they're here for the taking. But, but, you know, there's something about dad jokes. We, we all know that they make absolutely no sense it's a play on words and we say them guys admit it we say them a lot of times because we know that our wives are not going to get it right away and we know they're going to be sitting there thinking what was he saying and we're just over there just a giggling and then when we say it they get that look on their face ah, that was pretty stupid <laughs> but that's how it is that's how it is but we're gonna we're gonna move right along um we're going into week three of our series that we titled, Who is at the Table? Week three of Who is at the Table? If you have your Bibles, we are going to go to John chapter 15 in just a moment. But before we do, we're going to recap real quickly of what some of the things that we had discussed over the first two weeks. In week one, we saw that Jesus is God and he is the reason for all things. We understand that all things were created for him and by him all things are held together. And then we went into week two last week, and we saw that Jesus walked more than a mile in our shoes. We saw that he was fully God and fully man, faced every temptation we will ever face, and remained sinless and pure to provide a way for us to get back to the Father. And now we're walking into week three. In week three, we're going to shift just a little bit. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to, to look at Jesus a little bit differently. Remember, this is all based on Psalms 23 and how he has prepared a table for us in, in, in the presence of our enemies. He has prepared a table for us on the battlefield. And we want to know who this is that is inviting us to sit down. And, and so as we look a little bit deeper into his resume and into his, his profile, we reach a very important section Today, you know, don't you hate it when you write resumes or you have to fill out applications for work and each one of them are, are divided into sections? You got personal information, you got work history, you've got uh, references, and then you got special skills. We've get into a part now to where Jesus 
is going to be, we're going to look at him a little bit different. Different areas that he has filled in our lives. We're going to look at some different roles that Jesus has played in our life. Different areas he has offered himself to help us to see the love that he has for us. Today we start with a role that everyone wants and most of us play sometime in our life. And that is the role of friend. Jesus is a friend. Listen to some of these quotes that we have. I would rather walk with a friend in dark than alone in the light. That was quoted by Helen Keller. A true friend accepts you. Well, he accepts who you are, but also helps you become who you should. Friendship is another word for love. If you live to be a hundred, I hope that I live to be a hundred minus one day so that I will never have to live without you. Winnie the Pooh said that. But how true is that for some of us? A real friend is one who walks in when the rest of the world walks out. The only way to have a friend is to be one. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to John chapter 15. We're going to read verses 9 through 15. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And this is what the Word of God says. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in His love. I have told you this so that, you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. If you are my friends, if you do what I command... I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. I pray that you bless your word today, Lord, and I pray that you do what you can do. Father, these words will be empty without your anointing, without your spirit touching the hearts and the minds of those that are listening. I pray, God, that you will speak to them in a powerful way. And I pray, Father, that your work and your will will be done. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Jesus is a friend. Our text, when you begin to look at John chapter 15, our text is a smaller portion of a longer conversation that Jesus is having with his friends. It is more of Jesus pouring out his heart because he knew the time that was drawing near. Jesus was making one more big push to strengthen the disciples, to strengthen his friends. If you look at John chapter 13 and John chapter 17, this is one long conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples right before he was arrested. It is the longest discourse, it's the longest conversation that is recorded in the New Testament. The second longest is the Beatitudes found in Matthew. No other place in the New Testament will you find this much of Jesus talking together than you find right here in John chapter 13 through 17. It ends, the conversation ends when he's arrested in the garden. When you begin to look at that, that means that John recorded in his account of what Jesus did, almost 25% of what he recorded in his book was this conversation that Jesus was having with his disciples. And to me, I don't know about you, but to me, that's extremely heavy. And that means it's extremely important for us to understand what Jesus is saying. In John chapter 15, Jesus is pouring out into individuals he had pulled from the mire. And he was reinforcing everything they had told them from the beginning of their walk that started three years prior to this conversation. Even on the eve of his arrest and subsequent crucifixion, Jesus was thinking about his friends. 
In John chapter 14, verse 31, y'all don't have this. It says, but come, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Jesus is telling them right before we get to our text, I'm doing this and I have come so the world will see that I am doing exactly what my Father in heaven has told me to do. I'm not veering to the left or to the right, but I'm staying right where he told me to. And I want to reinforce what I'm trying to tell you. I want to reinforce what he has told me to tell you. You see, a good friend will always put others ahead of themselves. I want you to let that sink in for just a moment. A good friend will always put others, will put friends in front of their own self, in front of their own well-being, in front of their wants and desires. Jesus was planting seeds of his heart into the hearts of his disciples multiple times. And multiple times in this conversation, you can find the quote, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus understood what was about to happen. He understood what was going on and he told them over and over again, do not let your hearts be troubled. I've come to do what the Father asked me to do and I'm doing that. Let my joy be in you so that your joy may be complete. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I know what's about to happen, but you don't. But he tells us in this conversation, I'm telling you now, that way when it does happen, you will know that I am the one that was sent and you will know why I am here. I'm telling you before it happens. He told them exactly what was going to happen. The same as when he has walked into your life and he is showing you time after time after time. He is a friend of yours. And he is putting you above everything else. There's no other person sitting in the sanctuary that's more important to Jesus Christ than you are right now. The Bible says he is no respecter of persons and there's nobody more important to him than you alone. There's a few points that I want to get to. And first is this, a friend loves. When you look at our text, you can find it in verse 13. Greater love has none than this. To lay down one's life for his friends. Sometimes it's hard to understand how God could love us. It's hard to understand how God could love you. We have a hard time loving ourselves, let alone a holy God, loving somebody like us. If I was to ask you the all-important question, do you believe that God loves you? Would your heart and your mind and your actions all agree? Or do you sit back and you say... In in the darkness of your room, in the darkness of night, when nobody's around, do you doubt the love God has for you because of the things and the decisions that you have made? You see, it's because of those decisions that he loves you. It's because of those decisions that Jesus walked this earth for 33 years. It's because of them decisions that he is trying to show you through the conversation with the disciples that he is here for you. You see, a friend loves you beyond the mistakes that you make. A friend loves you through the mistakes that you make. A friend loves you out of those mistakes. And because of a friend's love, sometimes it pulls you out of the mistakes that you're making. And it stops you from making that mistake over and over and over. That is Jesus. A friend that loves He created love because he is love. If you go to John chapter 4 verse 10, the Bible says this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loves us so much, he sent his son to be sacrificed for us. If you go up to John 4 and 8, 1 John 4 and 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. There's no other thing that God can be but love. He loves his creation. He doesn't want man to go to hell. He doesn't want man to be condemned. But he understands and he allowed free will to be in our life. And so he sent his son to show you that it could be done. He sent his son to show you that there could be a pure and sinless life. We will never be pure and sinless. But we can have his blood on our account. We can be looked at through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew who he was walking with. 
And he was pouring love into them. Think about it. Before the conversation happened, it started with what? Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. It started with him washing the feet of every one of them. And then the conversation got heavy. When him and Judas dipped their hands at the same time, and he says, do what you have to do quickly. And Judas left because he understood that Jesus knew what he was about to do. Judas knew, but for some reason he could not stop. And he continued because he had given over to that. But Jesus washed his feet because he's a friend that loves. Jesus is a friend that gives grace. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's a throne of grace according to the, the writer of Hebrews. Let us approach God's throne of grace. A place we receive what we do not deserve. The very definition of grace. You don't deserve what God has given you. You don't deserve the love Jesus has shown you. Absolutely none of us do. But that's what grace is. You don't deserve it. But I'm going to give it to you anyway. You see, grace is for the recipient. It's not for the giver. You, you have to understand that sometimes we think big of ourselves when we extend grace to somebody and we can just flip our hair or we can, we can go off and do whatever we have to do because we have given somebody grace. But grace is not for the giver. Grace is for the recipient that, that gets something they do not deserve. It's exactly what Jesus Christ has done to each and every one of us as a friend. He has extended the grace. He knew his disciples he knew in just a few short hours those disciples were going to desert him. And yet, he still told them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Let my joy be in you so that your joy may be full, that it may be complete. No greater love has a man than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. The disciples did not deserve Jesus' friendship, but he gave it to them anyway. They did not deserve a second chance, but Jesus was setting them up for just that, the ultimate second chance. You know, it doesn't matter how many times Jesus healed somebody. It doesn't matter how many times he went into the synagogue and says, your sins are forgiven. It was when he went to the cross and shed the blood, made the covenant pure and made the covenant there to where it could never be destroyed again. The covenant could not be broken because Jesus lived the life and became the sacrifice that none of us could do, no matter what we did, how good we were. It was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that allowed this to happen, and all because he's a friend that gives grace. We have all received grace if you have not received grace, you can't, because the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Our whole relationship with God, our future, our eternity, is because of the grace that has been given to us through Jesus Christ. We could not even begin to think about what heaven would be like was it not for the grace that God gave us through his son and us believing in that grace and him giving us the ability to have salvation through the life of his son Jesus. Grace is given because that's how much he loves us. He was fully God and fully man. He came down, sat at the table as God himself. And yet he walked as man, and as he walked as man, he was giving us grace so he can fulfill what his father told him to do. When you listen to verse 9 of our text, as the father has loved me, so I have loved you and remained, now remain in my love. I love the father and do exactly what my father has commanded me. Think about that. Think, well, what would you do? If you understood that what your father was asking you to do, and you understood what it was going to cost you, could you still go through with it? 
Jesus understood what it was going to cost him when he walked this earth. And as he walked this earth, he went and found the ugliest and the meanest and the, and the most forgotten that he possibly could to extend grace to them so he can show them what love was all about. You cannot love without grace. You cannot be a friend without grace. And you cannot truly show grace without love. Jesus was being the only person that he could be. And church, that is enough for me. Give me Jesus. I can make it. Give me Jesus, and I will overcome. Give me Jesus, and I can storm the gates of hell. And nothing will be able to stop me. Give me Jesus, and I will wait on the whisper as it comes my way when I need to hear him. All I need is Jesus. All I need is him in my life. All I need is to walk with him and, and to understand who he is to me. It doesn't matter what, what the media says. It doesn't matter what the church says. It doesn't matter what you say. I understand who he is to me. You see, the grace that brings us to life in Christ can also be accessed to get us through life in Christ. I'm going to say that again. The grace that brings us to life, Ephesians chapter 2, can also be accessed to get us through life. The same grace that saves you is the same grace that you can fall upon and to receive the strength that only he can give you. It is the grace of God through his son that we can stand here and understand we have a purpose for life. My third point is this. Jesus is a friend to the sinner, the loser, the forgotten, the pushed aside, the ignored the downtrodden, Jesus is a friend to the friendless. Those that were hearing Jesus speak this text, I want you to think about that for a moment. Sometimes it's hard for us to, to put our minds into a story. It's hard to put ourselves into the situation that we find in this text. It's hard for us to, to see what God is trying to get us to see. But think about the disciples as they just had their feet washed. They just had the Last Supper. He just told them about the breaking of the bread and the wine and the blood and, and the covenant that was coming. He just he kept telling them about the, the advocate that was coming on his behalf. The Father was going to send somebody. And now he's telling them this. The disciples were not the cream of the crop. The creme of the crop. The disciples were not the ones that society wanted to go after. They were not the ones campaigning to have a place of, of power. They were not the ones spending millions and millions of dollars on ads so they can get, get voted into Congress and get voted into the Senate and, and have a place uh, at the seat at the table. The disciples were those that were, that were society didn't even know who they were. They were a dime a dozen. No matter where you looked, you saw people like the disciples. They had no influence. They didn't have anything going for them. But something about them, Jesus drew them unto himself. And he began to teach him because he knew what the Father had placed in them. Society did not cater to the disciples. Society shunned them and tried to hush them. Even after the resurrection, society tried to kill and even killed all of the disciples. Minus one. Because they didn't want to hear what they had to say. But yet Jesus Christ had done something to them. This conversation had done something into the hearts and the minds and the spirits of the disciples. That they could not turn when things got bad. They, they took to, to heart and they heeded the word of, of Christ. Do not let your hearts become troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled when you see this. Don't worry. They're going to hate you. They hated me first. They understand you're not from this world because you're a part of me and I'm not of this world. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Those that had, those that could, they looked down their noses at the people like the disciples, the friends of God. Aren't you glad that society didn't change the heart of Jesus Christ? 
How many of you have seen people you have followed on social media or in politics or whatever, and they were this way than, than years and years of service, and all of a sudden they have become changed, and they're doing something differently because somebody else is beginning to influence them, and, and now they're taking on somebody else's is, is mindset and somebody else's is desires. Jesus was not influenced by society. And because of that, he was able to put some things in the hearts of the disciples. You see, Jesus did not come to earth to get a trophy. Jesus did not come to earth to become famous. Jesus did not come to earth to become the king. He came to earth as the king. He came to earth to show people that he was the king, but yet they rejected him. He did not come to sit on his throne on this earth. He understood where his throne was. He came for the sinner. He came for the friendless, for the lonely and the broken, for the sick and the wrecked. Jesus came for the heart of those that would accept him. He understood that there was going to be those that would reject him until their dying day. And he still came and gave his life and poured his heart out. And he sends people their way day after day after day, trying to open up their minds and hearts to receive the grace that he has. But yet they walk away. He understood that. But you see, a friend is one that stays there even when you don't want them there. A friend is one that stays there without reward. Do you have somebody like that in your life? That no matter what happens, you know they're there. No matter what happens, they're not going to judge you because they understand that you're a, a person that has faults just as themselves. The enemy would try to get you to believe that because of your sins, Jesus could never like you. And some of you fight those battles in your mind every single day of your life. Jesus don't like me. Jesus can't even love me. I, I, I know who I am and what I do. And I know what I'm about to do. But you must remember that because of those sins, Jesus gave up his privilege and came down to show you that he does like you. And as a matter of fact, he loves you with every ounce of his life. There's an old song that came into my mind when I was putting this together. And the chorus goes simply like this. No one is beyond the love of Jesus Christ. And here's the chorus, because it reaches to the highest mountains. And it flows to the lowest valleys. That blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. You know, some of them old songs right there can still get a church jumping and still get a church pumping because there is some power within those words. When we begin to understand what that, what that, that chorus is saying, there is nobody that is out of the reach of Jesus Christ. There is nobody his love will not reach and cannot change. All you have to do is open your heart and accept the friendship of Jesus. He came to fill the role in your life as friend. And as he is filling the role of your life as friend, he is showing you what true love is. He is showing you what grace is. He is showing you that no matter if anybody ever looks at you, he's got his eyes on you and he's in love with you and he wants you to be successful in life and he's made a place for you and the Bible says that, that if my father does not have a place I would not have told you but I am going to prepare a place and I'm going to bring you unto myself he loves you and he wants to change your life but we have to allow him in us we have to allow him in our hearts and in our minds we have to push the enemy aside and come closer to the table that he has set for us you see, my last point is this. Jesus is a friend that will never leave you. Hebrews 13 and 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. A promise that was given back in Deuteronomy 31 as they was wandering around, not trying to, not understanding what was going on while they couldn't get into the promised land. 
And God promised him, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. No matter what you go through, I'm right there where you are. You might not hear or feel or see me, but I am right there because I will never leave you. A promise that was given. A promise that is held true during the invasion after invasion after invasion of God's people. He still was there, and he still delivered them, and he still had a place, and he still has God on the... Uh, he's, Jesus Christ is still on his throne, and he is still showing you that no matter what happens, no matter what where you go, no matter what you go through, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. That promise is still true today. He is not like the friends that call in late hours of the night just because they need something. You got somebody like that? You, you look over at your phone, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know if I want to listen to Bob today. I don't know if I want to answer this phone because I know what he's going to ask me. And all he wants is something. He's All he ever wants is to take from me. You see, Jesus is not like that. Jesus is not like the friends that won't go home or understand the atmosphere around a situation. You have, do you have friends like that? They can't read the room. They, they, their, their, their senses are deadened. And whenever they're in a situation, it could be a very sensitive situation. And all they want to do is come up and joke around and do this and do that because they don't understand what's going on because all they are is in it for themselves. They want to be there for themselves. They're not there for you. This is not who Jesus is. Jesus is a friend that is there when you need him. Jesus is a friend that is there when you don't think you need him. He is there when you think that you're alone, but you're glad that you're not. Jesus is there when it seems to get too tough and you need a little extra help. Jesus is the friend that gave that promise that you believe. It is, it is the real, what I call the true pinky promise. You remember those in grade school? You gotta, if it's a pinky promise, it's got to happen. You can't break it. And if you break that pinky promise, you can never longer be friends. Jesus made a pinky promise to you that he has never broken. He doesn't plan to break it, and he plans to fulfill it. It is an outstretched promise that we can see on Calvary that we celebrated just a few short months ago. He, he stretched his arms out to show you that his promise was true and that he was going to do what he needed to do to give you life eternal. Jesus is a friend and his promise can never be defeated. John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help and be with you forever. Verse 17 says, the spirit of truth. The word cannot, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives in, with you and will be in you. There is a promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit right there. And Jesus began to say, he's right here with you and soon he's going to be living on the inside of you. He said that he would always be there. A friend that never leaves, and he is inviting you to a table to sit and to stand and sit in front of your enemies. The most telling about this role, you have to look at it with big lenses. A true friend can read a situation and actions according to what is best for that friend. Jesus knew what was coming. But he knew what they needed. And he knows what you need right now. Jesus is a friend above all friends. And I think one of the verses, I don't know how many times I read chapters 13 through 17 this week. Just kept reading over and over and over. Just, just trying to live within that conversation that Jesus was having with his disciples. Just trying to be a part of it. Just... just trying to smell the dust from their feet as they walked in the garden, as he laid down to pray. Just understanding that that conversation was placed here by God himself for us to understand this conversation is the same conversation God is having with you right now. It's the same conversation he's having with you right now. The worship team would come. He wants you to understand he is a friend above friends. He wants you to understand that no matter what happens, he's here on your behalf. No matter what you go through, no matter what you feel, he is a friend that has you at heart. You see, I, I thought... 
this very important because if you really begin to look at what that scripture says and you look a little bit deeper, you understand that Jesus tells the disciples that the Father loves me. And I love you the same way the Father loves me. And you show people that you love me by following my commands and by loving others. But but if if you begin to look at that, Jesus Christ loves us the way the Father loves him. But that's how much the Father loves us. That's how much he wants to change your life. I want to pray with you today. Because there's people struggling. There's people not understanding the love that God has for them. You know the word. You know the terminology. You know all of that. But. But you don't really know that love. When you begin to think, wait a second. Jesus loves me the same amount that the Father loves him. And the Father created everything that we see through him so that we can experience it. So if you put two and two together, the love that the Father has for the Son, the Son has for the Father. And the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God. And that same love is shared by us. The same love that God had for His Son is the same love that He has for us loves us so much that he gave a son that means when we begin to think about the trinity and the unity of that trinity we're right there in the middle of it because we share that same love are we gods absolutely not do we have that same power and authority no we have what god gives us but the love we do have And it's that love that breaks every yoke in your life. It's that love that changes everything in your life. It's that love that sent Jesus for you. It's that love that he told his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's that love that he's telling you, don't let your hearts be troubled. You're going through some stuff right now. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to walk through this with you. Believe in me. You believe in the Father, believe in me.